Ajahn. So tell us about Majjhima Nikaya 11, the Chula Sihanata Sutta. So the Chula Sihanata Sutta, the shorter discourse on the lion's roar, is really all about confidence and what it means to, for an enlightened being to have confidence and to express that confidence. Uh, there's a central paradox, um, which is quite fascinating and I, I think really puts it on individual practitioners. The Buddha encouraging practitioners to make this lion's roar, to say only here are there hmm. some, a first type of samana, a second type of samana, a third type, a fourth type. And what he's pointing to here is he's reusing, repurposing an existing word, which he often does. The word is samana, which can mean a religious renunciant, a religious seeker. Often his time, he was a samana. Um, all kind of renunciates are, are samanas, but he's repurposing the word to be less about the outfit that someone's wearing or the mm. lifestyle that one is living necessarily uh, into more about the uh, types of mental states and the inner, the heart qualities that one has, one has and that one has abandoned. And he goes into eight different special qualities of someone who's enlightened, mm. uh, which is a fascinating list in and of itself. And such a one is capable and qualified to roar this lion's roar. It's someone who whose heart is free from greed, free from mm -hmm. anger, free from delusion, free from craving, free from clinging, uh, who has vision, someone who doesn't favor or oppose, and someone who doesn't mm. proliferate. Mm. So a really high uh, bar for what it means to be a samana, really raising the game from just the, the outer garb. Yeah, the Buddha then goes on to talk about uh, four different types of clinging, clinging to sensuality, clinging to views, clinging to uh, rites and rituals and clinging to doctrines of self. And uh, yeah, it says that a samana won't do that. Hmm. So it's a true samana is someone who doesn't cling to views, doesn't cling to doctrines of self, doesn't favor and oppose, yet still they can roar this lion's roar. Hmm. So it's all about confidence. And I find it just a fascinating koan for when and how could I have the confidence, deep, utter, penetrating, absolutely no doubt confidence to you know make such a declaration mm. either about myself or about the buddha's teaching not coming from an attachment to view not coming from a doctrine mm. of self uh and not coming from favoring my own view and opposing someone else's so um yeah high bar and interesting thing to look at within one's own estimation of self so that's great or not self yeah nice. <laughs> so ajahn what do you find interesting about this sutta you point to this, I mean, just hearing you lay out the progression of qualities that give one's confidence, it's, it's beautiful, that kind of progression of being dear and agreeable, and then to not favoring and opposing, and then to non-proliferation. I mean, it's it's such a beautiful progression. I love how being dear and agreeable to one's companions is a clear hallmark or metric for a doctrine that is that is correct to one's companions in the spiritual life. But some of the more refined elements in the sutta, specifically the two types of views that the Buddha lays out as the ones that the world becomes entangled in of non-becoming and becoming. And those in some places are defined as non-becoming is the view that the self doesn't persist after death, annihilationism, uh, uchedavada in some other suttas, which is the prominent view I'd say in the Western world at the moment. And um, the view of becoming that the self transmigrates from life to life as a kind of unchanging entity, the Atman, which is a very Vedic view. And the Buddha is saying that, you know, neither of those is correct, but there's a third way, avoiding both extremes of dependent origination, these 12 links of how the sense of self and craving and birth is created um, lifetime after lifetime, moment after moment. And it's just this radical phenomenology where, um, you know, I've heard someone say in Buddhism, there's no nouns, there's only verbs. And that's really what I see here is, you know, and to, to note how in Buddhism, so often the middle path isn't this median or mean between the two extremes. It's this completely other approach and usually a very practical approach. You know, it's not the Buddha necessarily trying to, uh, lay down this ontological framework so much as this is how you look at how you create suffering with 12 links. And 
so just, I mean, I know we spoke about dependent origination last sutta, but um, it's worth touching on again in this context, I think, too. Mm. So Ajahn, what have you found uh, worthy of highlighting in this or relevant in your life? Mm. Two things. Um, one of them is just a term which he uses, uh, sahadamika, translated as uh, dhamma-fairer, mm. or basically one who travels along with one. The Buddha says that it's one of the four factors that makes one qualified to give this lion's roar. It's someone in, who is dear and agreeable to one's sahadamika, whether that's monastics or lay people. Mm. So it's a term which is, um, yeah, goes both ways. It's like we, it's, I feel one thing that this sutta is doing is really in some degree questioning what it truly means to be awakened and uh, to live an awakened life. Um, he's pulling away from the externals of things as to and towards the direction of the heart. We're traveling together in Dhamma, whether lay people or monastics. Not all monastics are enlightened. Mm. And it's very possible for lay people to reach various stages of, of enlightenment, of awakening. And I think that's great, kind of knocking down, reassessing and questioning what does it what does it truly mean to be a mm. samana? Uh, and also, yeah, just internally. I mean, it's something that just uh, a couple of days ago I was on on alms and someone asked me. Uh, it, we were walking by each other in the street. He looked like he was living hard, maybe living on the streets, and get past each other. And he spits on the ground and he says, "Imposter." Mm. And uh, really taken aback is a forceful thing, but it did make me question. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, what what am I? What am I displaying to the world? And as a monastic, fortunately, we have these very, as a Buddhist monastic, these very clear goals. And am I working towards those goals of ridding the heart, purifying the heart from greed, anger, and delusion, getting rid of attachment and craving, mm-hmm. and seeing the world clearly, not favoring, not opposing, not proliferating? So yeah, it's a good kind of a wake-up hmm. call, although a somewhat unpleasant one. So. Hmm. And how about you, Ajahn? What do you find interesting or usable in this sutta? Practical? I mean, one just to draw a little more out is the extreme views of uh, becoming and non-becoming. I don't think this is particularly what the Buddha is pointing to, but I find there's a resonance with those two views, with the mental habits that so many of us are caught in, um, non-becoming, uchedavada, annihilationism, uh, just really mapping on to this, you know, affliction of the heart with thinking things are meaningless, with a kind of deep depression of not having a sense of um, kind of uh, goal in life and and the acknowledgement that you can really become attached to that view. And the Buddha in other places compares these two views of becoming and non-becoming to a, a post which a dog circles around and it circles one way for becoming and the other way for non-becoming. Yeah. But both are circling, tied to a post. And, you know, with something like depression or self-flagellation, self-recrimination, which is so prominent, um, it can become something we become very familiar with and comfortable with and feed in an unwholesome way because it's comfortable. So, yeah, once again, and the Buddha pointing away from that towards this ethic of, of change. Like, how do we look at our experience as something we can alter through knowledge, um, you know, in terms of applying vija vision to dependent origination and the cycle of of birth. Mm. So what's our word of the week, Ajahn? The word of the week is samana, which means literally means recluse or renunciant, ascetic. Um, it was a wanderer at the time of the Buddha. The Buddha himself was a samana, and it's uh, the Buddha here is repurposing it, and we could translate it as a holy person or someone who's actually attained or become mm. enlightened, coming from the root. Uh, meaning either to put forth effort or to become calm. Mm. And that's what, uh, yeah, all of us who are trying to be true samanas are inclining towards. So So, thank you, Ajahn. We hope to see you all or those of you joining us on Sunday in about a minute on Zoom. And the others we'll see for Majjhima Nikaya 12 next week. Ajahn.